Now, here's proof that women are tired of being considered sex symbols. It's an entire book on the male posterior. Now, this book wasn't made in Oklahoma, but that doesn't mean that Oklahoma women aren't uh, looking. The best place to catch women watching is in the shopping malls. There's something for everyone. Action 4 sought out these expert watchers to find out just who the sexiest man in Oklahoma is. Jerry Adams, I think he's the most handsome, sexiest man on our television right now. <laughs> you mean a prominent person of oh, some repute. Uh, probably Barry Switzer. Okay. My husband would have to, I'd have to say my husband is the sexiest man in Oklahoma. Are you sure? Well, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> I'll have to stick with that. <laughs> okay. And then I guess, I'm sure Barry Switzer at least thinks he is. <laughs> in Oklahoma? The only person I can think of from Oklahoma is the governor and it's not him. <laughs> Well, you can't win them all, Governor. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. This time yesterday afternoon, authorities were at the Frontier Federal Savings and Loan investigating the establishment's second robbery in about a week. Two armed men wearing ski masks successfully entered and left with an undetermined amount of cash. Normally, Frontier Federal doesn't have armed guards, but now things have changed. We're definitely going to enhance the security. Uh, we will have uh, uh, armed security within the facility and we'll also uh, have uh, security that will roam from branch to branch uh, in an effort to uh, deter uh, this situation from happening again. Last year in Oklahoma, 10 financial institutions were robbed. This year, there's been 26. Partially due to the booming economy in Oklahoma, robbing a bank seems like the thing to do. But as FBI agent Terry O'Connor explains, it's not always that profitable. Sometimes you have to wonder why it would be attractive to anyone. First of all, the, uh, the average take in a bank robbery is not that great. The, the savings and loans, the banks uh, intentionally keep the amount of money on hand low so that their losses are, are minimized. And in the case of a robbery, last year uh, throughout the country, the average take in bank robberies was $2,784. Uh, again, as I pointed out, the, the chances that the bank robber or robbers are going to be caught is, is high. O'Connor adds that last year alone, nine out of the ten robberies committed in the state were solved. Carol Lambert, Action 4. Hundreds of people lost their jobs recently at the General Motors plant here in the city. The reason is that GM is converting its assembly plant to make A-bodied cars instead of X-bodied cars that weren't selling well. As a result, a lot of people are out of work. Many will get their jobs back in a few months, and even more will be put back to work if the cars start selling again. Right now, car lots are filled with cars that aren't moving. 
While all of this reflects an increase in the unemployment rate, a spokesman for the Oklahoma Employment Security Commission says there are some good things to consider about well, Oklahoma. Uh, the state of Oklahoma has had the lowest rate for about eight consecutive months, and Oklahoma City has had the lowest rate among metropolitan areas in some of those months. Now, the mining boom, of course, has been very substantial in Oklahoma. The number of uh, jobs in mining, and I'm referring to oil and gas, is up approximately 20 percent from this time last year. And then we have the spillover into other industries. The oil field machinery and equipment manufacturing has been strong. Uh, supply industries related to mining. And, of course, it spurred construction. The oil and gas boom could last another three to five years, keeping unemployment in the state low and far below the national average. The number of people out of work in Oklahoma could go higher next year, but that percentage will always be offset by the large number of people out of work nationwide. Acting on an anonymous tip earlier this afternoon, Action 4 was at the scene when two parachutists jumped off the top of the 32-story Galleria 2 tower. With winds gusting close to 20 miles per hour, the two jumpers eased their way out on the edge of the high-rise building. This type of sport is called base jumping and is not recognized by national parachuting organizations. It's also illegal. It does, however, provide some kind of thrill and excitement to the participants. The man on the right, known as Sammy, is from California and has done base jumping 11 times. For the jumper on the left, today's attempt was the first. Twenty-year-old Tim Bays of Edmond made it down without a hitch. How do you feel? Great! Woo! But it wasn't so good for his partner. From this view, you can see the Californians shoot open late. He hit the ground hard, while his partner sailed safely overhead. Where must I go? Hey, I'll go ahead and take these back to the bar or the jail. The injured jumper has been taken to St. Anthony's Hospital and is in stable condition. He's thought to have a broken collarbone. Moments later, authorities arrested his jumping partner, and even though it's Bayes' first jump from a building, police consider it a serious offense. Trespassing charges are expected to be filed against the pair. Carol Lambert, Action 4. This is what's called a workover rig. These men are setting up this rig to make some needed repairs on this well. Now, this is just one of two small producing wells located on airport property. This particular well was drilled last year. Local oil man Jim Brewer of Diversified Oil and Gas Exploration has an interest in this well. He says there will be more wells drilled in the airport area. Right now, we've got a gross acreage position with airport and surrounding it of about 10,000 acres. And you can see here in the background, there's four rigs drilling around the airport. We feel like it probably this year on the airport and off airport, we'll probably drill somewhere or be involved in drilling of uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 wells. One might think oil rigs near an airport would cause a lot of problems. But according to Brewer, the rigs have been adapted to meet airport and FAA specifications. Brewer says he hopes someday to drill a well at the entryway of Will Rogers Airport. He says the well at the state capitol is such a good conversation piece around the country, a well here at Will Rogers would only further benefit Oklahoma's reputation as an oil boom state. Ben McCain, Action 4 at Will Rogers Airport.
A viewer writes in and says, I took my car to an auto mechanic for repairs after a minor collision. He now has kept my car for over seven months because, according to him, he can't get one part. Well, the part is purely ornamental, and I've tried constant phoning, but to no avail. The car has an out-of-state license tag and is not registered in Oklahoma. I'm afraid the mechanic has stolen and sold our automobile. Can he get a new title? Well, in Oklahoma, in order to legally acquire a new title to an automobile, there must be an assignment of the old title to the new owner. If there is no title, a new title may be obtained from the Oklahoma Tax Commission. However, it is possible that the new title could be forged or the identification number on the automobile illegally altered in order to obtain a new Oklahoma title. You should go to your mechanic's place of business, and if the car is not on his premises, call the police. For Action 4, this is Ray Vaughn with Legal Briefs. A viewer writes in and says, my nephew has suggested that I give him a power of attorney. If I do, will he be able to sell my real estate and cash my certificates of deposit without my approval? He may very well be able to do that unless the power of attorney you give him limits his powers. If it would be desirable to give him this power for a limited purpose, then you would be wise to make sure the document you sign says he is only authorized to do those acts that you want him to do. For Action 4, this is Ray Vaughn with Legal Briefs. Okay. It was here on January 3rd when the bodies of Russell Lee Wilson of Norman and Lisa K. Kusick of Jones were found. Both had been shot to death in a car just south of the dam at Lake Overholzer. Robert Artizone and his brother Marty Ray Artizone have been arrested by Oklahoma City Police, charged with first-degree murder. The deaths are said to be drug and robbery related. The morning after the murders, Marty Artizone allegedly broke into a couple of Oklahoma City homes, yelling someone was after him. Witnesses say he suddenly appeared in a woman's living room and broke out through a glass plate window, then moments later breaking into another home, chasing the owner out. At his alleged third housebreak attempt, he was shot, but managed to stumble to a fourth house where he was let in and police arrived. Ed Stewart, Action 4, Oklahoma City. Mr. Mondale said the eyes of the nation were on Oklahoma waiting to see what the Sooner State would do. But, Mondale said, Oklahoma doesn't need his advice. A broad cross-section of the distinguished bipartisan leadership of this marvelous state stands together asking Oklahoma to take this historic step to move our nation on a more just path. The fact of it is, we never could, but especially cannot now, afford or tolerate injustice toward women in this country.
balance, get this budget da uh, down and uh, closer to balance to get those interest rates down. We need to uh, adjust that farm program, not, not to make the farmers rich or to guarantee profits. They don't want that, but to just protect them uh, against disaster because I'm afraid we're going to see wholesale uh, farm foreclosures if, if around this country if we're not careful again, something we haven't seen. While Edmond has been growing in leaps and bounds lately, portable signs have been sprouting up faster than toadstools after a spring thunder shower. Call them signs of the times. The Edmond City Council calls them a nuisance. City fathers recently passed an ordinance outlawing portable signs in Edmond. Businesses like Delta Carpets say they need these portable signs to help attract customers. So Delta teamed up with a couple of other local businesses and a local portable sign company filed suit against the city. They claim Edmonds' prohibition against these portable signs is unconstitutional. Both sides were in state district court today. The sign backers are trying to convince Judge Carmen Harris to grant a temporary injunction, barring the city from enforcing its ban on portable signs. The city wants to begin finding violators of its ordinance $35 a day. Our position basically is that the ordinance is unconstitutional. Uh, and uh, from a number of standpoints, it's vague and ambiguous. It uh, doesn't meet the constitutional standards that have been applied in recent court decisions. And the other thing is it was not enacted in accordance with the statutes uh, for the enacting of, of ordinances such as this. We consider it to be a zoning ordinance. People don't need to use portable signs to get the message they want to get across. They could use some alternative that's just as reasonable and probably just as inexpensive. And so our basic position is it's a valid ordinance, it was validly enacted, and it's enforceable. The hearing will resume tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at the Oklahoma County Courthouse. Other types of signs and the testimony in court has been, as people have used radio, TV, and... Uh, At about 6 o'clock last night, an entire building at the Forest Oaks Apartments caught fire, engulfing several individual apartments. Fortunately, the building was vacant, so no one was injured. It took firemen about an hour and a half to completely put out the burning debris. In today's light, the charred remains look desolate. The property was at one time government housing, but has since been purchased by a private owner. Officials have already set last night's damage close to $120,000. In addition, they feel sure it was arson. A flammable liquid was found in the residue on the wall and floor. Last night's incident is another statistic in the growing number of arsons in Oklahoma City. Assistant Fire Chief Bob Mal says it's a sign of the times. We, we do have a significant amount of, of arsons, and, and I believe you'll find uh, as we have a downturn in the economy, that's when many times we have arson, arson fires, arson-related fires. Uh, the time of year that we have, we have, seems like we have a larger amount of fires during the winter months. Um, and arson has become more visible nationally as well as here in the Oklahoma City area. Mal says Oklahoma City has a good track record in solving arson cases, and in this particular incident, he feels quite confident a suspect will be arrested. Carol Lambert, Action 4 at the Central Fire Station. after me to solemnly swear to solemnly swear that on a railroad interested in any railroad street railway street contract railway, or earnings contract or earnings of any railroad of any railroad pipeline pipeline car line car line sleeping car line sleeping phone or telegraph line telephone or telegraph line and that I will and that I will to the best of my ability
which now all of a sudden something, something just went, there was, something must have exploded and it just all flew out and this girl named Latasha got a table of uh, piled on her and I ran out, I ran out and that's it. Okay. Get together. Don't sit our kids. You're okay. You're okay. Don't you cry. It's all right. You are okay. You made it fine. Okay. Okay, okay. okay baby. She's all right. Emotions. Relatives of injured children gathered at the Midwest City Community Center. Information trickled into the center throughout the afternoon, and one by one, families were notified of the condition of their loved ones. Three families were notified here that their children had died in the explosion. Names of the injured were listed on chalkboards, and some rushed out of the room after checking that list. Meanwhile, the medical staff at Midwest City Hospital held a news conference on the children's injuries. 24 people have been brought to the, to the emergency department here at Midwest City. Two of those were adults. 22 uh, were children. One of the children died shortly after he arrived and was pronounced DOA. He did not respond to any of the resuscitation efforts. Um, four of the children have been admitted to this facility, three of which have gone to surgery for abdominal and or chest injuries and uh, fractures and so forth. Um, three have been transferred to Presbyterian Hospital with head injuries. One has been transferred to St. Anthony's Hospital with facial injuries, uh, which was an adult. Two children have been medevaced out by helicopter to Children's Hospital with head injuries. One of the things that I did this afternoon was check to see whether or not there had been any uh, repair work done on the, the heater recently, and I was informed by our, our maintenance department that a call did come from the school to check that hot water heater this morning, and it was checked, but again, I don't have the complete details, and that has not been reviewed by the inspectors, and it would be premature to draw conclusions as to whether or not there was a uh, direct relationship, if any relationship at all, between the two. Yesterday, the tail section of the Air Florida plane was lifted from the icy Potomac River. The records, which are usually housed in the rear of the plane, could not be found. But that was not a problem. Divers had 30 days to find the recorders. Once they hit the water, they transmitted a signal that led to their whereabouts, and they have been found. One data recorder weighs about 30 pounds and records up to 400 hours of flying time. While it doesn't measure things like the amount of ice on the wings, it does provide valuable information. Records all the air traffic control transmissions by the pilot, the co-pilot. It also records any 
any noises inside the cockpit or any conversation between the crew members. Experts at the National Transportation Safety Board will be studying these instruments carefully. The recorders are built to withstand the impact of any crash, and the horrible last seconds of that ill-fated plane are now on record, a record of that tragic air crash that will never be erased. Bella Shaw, Action 4 at the FAA Academy in Oklahoma City. The housing units at the Joseph Harp and Lexington Correctional Centers are two of the most modern facilities in the Oklahoma prison system. Each center can normally handle 400 prisoners. Before yesterday, all of the inmates were housed in individual cells. Each convict had an 80 square foot room to himself. The system provided unmatched privacy and security. But recently, more inmates have entered the Oklahoma penal system than have left. Officials had to put the extra inmates somewhere, so they began asking for volunteers willing to accept roommates. So far, they've doubled up 112 convicts at Lexington. Prison authorities are taking steps to make sure the new housing arrangement remains satisfactory. We're looking at making sure that the amount of time that's been out of the cell uh, certainly is, is more than uh, would normally be called for. You know. Uh, we're, we're going to try to keep people from having to be in locked situations, two to a cell, uh, just to try to preclude uh, having any problems arise between the individuals. Uh, we're going to also uh, uh, try to do this as much as possible on a voluntary basis. If the present growth in prison population continues, then 620 Oklahoma prison inmates could soon be housed in cells designed for half that many. That's enough inmates to nearly fill another new prison the size of Lexington. If the state does decide to build more prisons, it might learn a valuable lesson here at Lexington. Even with top priority put on this project, it still took 18 months to build this prison. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at the Lexington Correctional Center.